My belief is that when Adam and Eve was in the garden and they were clothed in light, that there wasn't a concept of time. And when you were talking, and then they entered into a time when time began in a physical reality, and they covered themselves with fig leaves. And it was almost as if, cosmically, the fig leaf came in and covered the whole, the cosmos covered in what you were talking about. That that occurred at that time. Is that close? Yeah, it's a good, it's a great metaphor in the sense that, um, the, the Genesis story says that you know there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So right away, there's your duality. There's your past and future, and there's your linear time. That's mm-hmm. all that that tree was. So, of course, the miracles comes along, and eh, we had the Adam and Eve story, and people would say, I don't know if there was a literal Adam and Eve, but I think it was an attempt to explain some what happened or so that something went wrong. And, of course, the miracles comes along, and Jesus and there says, um, you know, God would never put you in such a position, you know, and, and that's a good thing to look at too, that if there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God was there, and the serpent was there, why would he put his beloved creations anywhere near that tree, <laughs> you know, if God is all loving and all knowing? So in the course, he's, it's kind of a release of an ontological guilt and saying, you know, God didn't put you near that tree. You know, that tree is entirely of the ego's making, and it's, it's, a, it's a lie. It's a lie about your true spiritual identity. And so, in one sense, you can leave God out of it. Don't, don't get angry at God. It's just this error that you need to forgive or release about yourself and time. Really, it's about time is what it's about. So, linear time is, is, is that fig leaf, is that defense against the holy instant. Since you're there in the garden, the book somewhere I remember saying that God put Adam, Jesus said God put Adam to sleep and he never woke him. Somewhere in there is it? it kind of like that. It does say that. Something like that. I remember reading it. It says in the Bible, you know, it says Adam fell asleep. Uh-huh. And he never tells anywhere where no, he woke. It never says that, that he woke up. And so. And he took, while he was asleep, he took the rib. And made the one. You know, he put him to sleep to get the rib, and then make the woman from the rib. And not maybe that was the ego that did. From the minute he, you know, whatever happened, this was crooked. Something. You know, I, I don't know. There's got to be a story there, some way that relates to this. Well, I'll give you a. In fact, that we know what the Adam, Adam Eve story is, but in the course he gives you another little story. This is this doesn't involve men and women though, and this <laughs> this story does not involve a, um, garden and snakes and whatever. He says, into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. <laughs> That's his whole Genesis story. And the Course in Miracles is, in the end, I say you're going to have to give up that story because what atonement is, or what correction is, atonement is the awareness that the separation never happened. That's what enlightenment is. Enlightenment isn't getting your mind to a place where you can reconcile truth and illusion, or you can reconcile fear. Atonement is getting to a place where you are absolved of the thought of fear, that that you see that fear is not real. You know, perfect love casts out fear. Or we were just at a group today saying, if you bring the problem together with the solution, the problem disappears. Just like if you bring darkness and light together, it's going to be light. Or if you go and you turn on a light switch, you know, it's like the darkness and the light don't battle it out to see What's going to happen when that light is on? There's no such thing as darkness. There's no such thing as darkness. <laughs> well, when, exactly. we, when we get to that point, <clears throat> there's one little bitty step in there that God has to take for us, right? But does say God takes the final step. Yeah, well, I, I want to talk about that a little bit. And what, but if you really read what, what Jesus says carefully, he says God will take the final step. But he says that step was taken in your creation. In other words... Okay. When the mind thinks of final step, it's thinking in terms of time, as if like somewhere along the line down there, God will take the final step. But the final step was 
was creation. So in other words, the giving up of time returns the mind to a state of creative presence. But does he have to help you to give it up? Well, the Holy Spirit is the help. Right. <laughs> and that's just the presence in your mind that that sees the illusion but remembers the truth. So it you could say it's kind of like a, a bridge in your mind that, that sees the error but knows the error is not true and remembers the reality. Which is letting go of the illusion. Which is letting go of the illusion. So even in that sense, people will say, well, you know, it sounds like a dual function for the Holy Spirit. If he, if he sees the error but knows the truth, and it's like, well, the part that sees the error is just a metaphor. That part, of course, goes too, because how could, how could a creation of God look upon error? So that's the metaphor in our mind of that, that presence. Uh, we were talking about, Rayford and I were talking before the meeting last night about he just says, I just go out there, I'm out among the animals and just tuning in and asking the Holy Spirit and he's talking to me and talking through me and this and that. That's that presence in there that's just like like cleansing and washing the mind of air. That's what I, I was reading the other day about the Holy Spirit and I'm not too clear on that. And is it the only presence you think? It is our God self, our higher God self? Is that the Holy Spirit? It's kind of like... Some of us were raised in Christianity, and they had this uh, Trinity idea. Trinity, yes. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. and so forth. You might say God God is the prime creator, and God is the creator of all. And then Christ is not Jesus the man, because Christ is right. neither male nor female, and, and Christ is not uh, something that walks in time. Christ is an eternal... Of our consciousness. Christ, right, Christ is an idea in the mind of God. So you might say that... Christ is the effect. That God is the creator. Christ is the effect. And then Christ, Christ is the Son. Yeah, Christ is the Son of God. Yeah, you can say daughter. That's a, again. That's a, a word. Yeah, it, the book says Son. Yeah, but, but I'm not. I'm not saying that it's Christ. Chauvinist. No. <laughs> hey, you got it. God's, God's creation. <laughs> even though it says Son, and it just put. I know what I wasn't trying to say was male. Right. You know. <laughs> Right. It's just a, a yes, perfect yes. creation. <laughs> they can't get over it. We won't even call it sun, we'll call it Christ. Because right. Christ right. is a is a name for universal love. Right. It doesn't have a male or female connotation. Mm -hmm. So you've got God and then Christ and then Christ was given creative ability, so Christ has creations and they're pure spirit as well. They're not animals and plants. Those are still part of the illusion of time and they're bound in the rules of time. But so so there's the prime creator, the the creation, and then the creation creates too. So it's like a continual line of creation, almost like in form in the Bible. They go begat, begat, begat. Well, this is create, create, create. It's just a pure line of creation. For the mind that believes that separation is possible, which is falling asleep and forgetting that creation, it seems to need a helper because it seems to have circumscribed itself, its identity, in this crazy idea, a mad idea of time. And it seems to need a way out. It needs a way out of the time. So the Holy Spirit is, you might say, a, a symbol or a reminder to that mind. And there's no way really to, to understand the Holy Spirit in terms of the dual function, because that would be, again, like, how do you bring truth and illusion together? And how do you even make a bridge? But just think of it as this reminder in your mind that remembers your reality. It's constantly telling you how beautiful and perfect and innocent you are. No matter what seems to happen in time, that, that presence is just pure love. I read a line in the book where it says, the Holy Spirit knows what God cannot know and also knows what we cannot uh, God understand. knows everything. Right. It says that. It, it, and it brings, and, and the purpose is to bring those two back together. This is the problem, this is the solution. And once we bring the problem to the solution, and its job is to bring all of this that we're thinking, am I kind of yeah. on the right track? You could say that the Holy Spirit knows what God cannot know in the sense that God is pure spirit, so God doesn't know of time. So a lot of times people go, oh boy, how can he know what didn't doesn't exist? Right. So if he believed it, then, then it would be real. Exactly. If it was in, if there was any awareness or, or recognition. And on the flip side, the ego doesn't 
the ego can't know love and can't know God. And so that's where the bridge seems to be. It seems to be the ego belief and the return of the awareness of, of God and Christ. So in practical terms, that's that small, still voice that's prompting you in every moment of every day, calling you to return and, and guiding you. It's like, I think of it more as just a steady guide. That guide in there knows, imagine you seem to be in a maze of time and space of duality, and you know how mazes are, they're quite complicated, you know, with lots of nooks and crannies and lots of different turns, and that little small still voice that's a reminder in your mind that knows the way out is the Spirit, or the Holy Spirit that's just guiding you always. It's like the answer to the problem is right there, it's within you, and now the, the goal is to accept the answer. And it can, it, it can and must occur in an instant, but it seems to, with the, when the mind's terrified of that answer, it seems to take time even to open the mind to that answer. It seems to. It's the illusion of the process of enlightenment to the actual here and now of enlightenment, which, which is what enlightenment is. It's a here and now experience. I remember watching many years ago a, a videotape of Krishnamurti, um, and he's, this is 1972, and he's out in San Diego, and he's sitting up on the stage, and his eyes are twinkling and sparkling, and he's looking around at all the audience, and he's just absolute pure love, little teeny Indian man with white hair, and he's just so excited, and he's always got this glee on his face, you know, and he's like, tonight... We are going to look at fear so deeply that if you follow what I say, step by step, follow it with me, we'll go down to a point where you'll be completely absolved of fear forever. And he's absolutely serious. <laughs> he says, not the fear of your wife, not the fear of your husband. Or he talks about different things. I'm talking about, I mean, he's talking about fear. And I watched him in a, I don't know how long the videotape was, I was watching it in the Casco Mountains, and he takes it step by step. It's showing that by believing in the reality of the past and finding something desirable in the past, the mind then wants to repeat that desirable event. And then he talks about the movement of time. He's, he's literally talking about time, that time is the root of, of all error. And he's describing how it works, you know, that you, something you think you've experienced in the past and you want to repeat it, you know, like the Carly Simon song, Attachments, Attachments. and Anticipation, you know, that Carly Simon, cycle of rebirth. Yeah, <laughs> keeps me waiting, you know. So he's, he goes through that whole thing, and they keep showing during the video, you know, they'll go get shots of the audience, because he's going deeper, deeper, rapidly zooming down in the mind to the, to the original error. And people are like looking around like this. Thing. I mean, it's like, and, and like every five minutes he speaks, there's more people that are just like looking around like they don't have a clue of what he's even talking about. And he stops every five minutes and says, don't take what the speaker says to be the truth. He won't even refer to Krishnamurti. He goes, don't take what the speaker says to be the truth. Look at it for yourself. Are you there with me? You know, he's like, and then he goes another five minutes and people are, you know, because he's, you know, the audience is just like, what? You know, but, it's, but he's so thorough, you know, he's so meticulous and so loving and so polite and so kind that he's like, come into this experience together. And then he reaches at the end, he reaches the point where he shows the whole thing of the illusion of time. And he goes, did you get it? Did you get it? And he's, just, he's in the front of his chair. Did you get it? If you got it, wonderful. If you didn't get it, don't go home and think about it. <laughs> I'm just like, oh my God. I mean, what a, what a presence, you know. If you got it, you got it. If you got it in the here and now, if you followed it step by step, then you got it. And if you didn't get it, don't try to even go home and think about it because it, it's not it. When you're into thought of time, going home and thinking about it, as you're going doing your stuff, that's not it. That's not enlightenment. So I, I, that's how precious this present moment is. It's a state of recognition. But all it takes really is a willingness to just 
release the loop of time, release the belief that there's something incomplete that need, is going to take time to complete, as if it will take time to be who you are, which is the ultimate this, you know, joke <laughs> that it's going to take time. And of course, in miracles, so, I want to mention the swing thing too, is that in, in the Course of Miracles, Jesus says, the ego likes the idea of return to God. Return uh, to God. Because it can make the idea, idea seem extremely difficult. And unworthy. Yeah. Unworthy of God yeah. in the first place. Right, right. That you lost it. Yeah. You never lost it. Right. You can't lose what you are. Dave, <laughs> <laughs> so do you have the realization of no time? Yeah, I, I am living in the present in the sense that um, the people who are around me, they see that you, I just don't put attention to time in the sense of planning and so forth. I mean, even come, to come to do this gathering, there seems to be things that are requiring setup, and, and Kathy will go into prayer, really. Um, and uh, it's all very spontaneous, you know. Someone comes in and sends in an invitation and says, Come, Arvin gets a, a CD in, in, the, in the mail, and there's a little card with it that says, Oh, gathering's available. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll take I'll take one of those gatherings. You know, I want one of those gatherings. And so it seems to, in time, set in motion a chain of events where then Arvin writes and writes the rest of, and then back and forth in the communications, and then so he sets in motion uh, a trip for us to come from Cincinnati out here to Texas, and then lots of other things start to fill in in between. Um, in Indianapolis, intensives open up. Um, in St. Louis, a group of gatherings open up. In Oklahoma, just on the path to even come to answer this <laughs> one call from Marvin. Oh, all those others have, have transpired right. since. Oh, yes. right. Right. Marvin it started with right. this invitation. It starts with one Marvin. simple invitation, which that's when, of course, you have to have an invitation because I've got nowhere to go, and no one to convince, and really nobody to talk to either. You know, since I'm just like, I can be there content, so I'm just happy to just be and just be still. And all of a sudden, a call comes in. Oh, Texas, okay. And then all these other things have opened up. And in fact, then even when we were traveling here, we got to Indianapolis, the first city of this trip, we got there, and Rusty goes, we're half an hour early. You know, and so we met this man, we took a walk, and he asked me, don't you do anything worldwide? And I said, I don't even have a passport, I don't even, I mean, I just, there's nowhere to go. <laughs> and, and he says, well, I was, I said, we did get an invitation from Argentina. And he said, Argentina? I've been thinking that I was supposed to go to Argentina, and so by the time we walk another 15 minutes, it becomes apparent we're going to Argentina. <laughs> He's got frequent flyer miles, and the invitations come in, and I call Kathy up on the cell phone. I said, I need a birth certificate. I think I passed one of those Fima jiggies. Passport, David. It's called a passport. <laughs> it's not a Fima jiggy. <laughs> so, then they do. They get in motion, you know, and that's where the thing. And so, literally, within a couple days, the thing is set up. The, the the plane tickets, tickets are yeah, reserved. The passports. It's like <laughs> Resta came back to Cincinnati that first, well, the second day, and she and we, I looked for the the birth David's birth certificate. He didn't know where it was. There was one that was like one that showed his proof of birth for school, but and he thought that was a birth certificate. Well, like, oh, this isn't a birth certificate. So I called Jack and Evelyn, his biological parents, to see if they could find it. So, um, and, you know, Resta was guided to come back. So then I called them back that night when Resta came back, and they found it. So we went over to their house to get the birth certificate, and then Resta went back to um, Indianapolis to meet David, and then they went and got the pictures taken and everything for the passport. Yeah, I had a little encounter at the post office, and the woman assured me. <laughs> I said, do I need to do anything here? Like... I want to, I'm going in March, and this is, I mean, this is already yeah. the middle of January. I have no passport, and I'm going to be going in March. And, and she's like, you know, I said, do I need to do this expedite thing? And she said, no, you have time. Rest assured, it will get there, and so on and so forth. So, you know, uh, that was that. And, and meanwhile, while we've been on this trip, just coming down here, you know, there's been all this activity in Argentina. 
with these two translators working with 16 other Course in Miracle facilitators down there, setting up gatherings and all kinds of arrangements. And, you know, it's just like all that just is a flurry of activity. I have nothing to do with it. You know, it just seems to be happening, just like Arvin seeming to say, come. And so I saw nothing. I wasn't thinking at the beginning of this year, I'm going to Argentina. I didn't see that one coming at all. But when you live in the present moment, you don't see anything coming. You really don't. And you don't need to see anything coming. You don't need to have like a, v a vision of the future or what's going to happen. You just show up. I mean, that's the most wonderful thing about living in the moment is when I come to do these gatherings, I don't, there's no preparation for them. There's no um, things of what am I going to say or topics or whatever, you know. It's just the, the present moment orchestrates everything, whatever will be most helpful. And that's it. I just show up. That's all. But I'm, is that you as opposed to, I mean, you just show up, but she's doing all the, you know, work in the background. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, so that's not your task. That's her task. Well, it's not but even, it's, it's not a, even a, a her in it in the sense that when I say I show up, we have to look at what that means. I don't mean that David shows up, because David doesn't exist, and neither does anything in this realm. I show up in mind. I show up in mind with willingness. To be helpful and not have a clue. I have. There's no clue of of that how. In fact, I have a global mailing list of over a thousand people, and I get questions from around the world, and I answer it. And I'll answer the questions without using their even their names. Just talk, say the beloved one, and they pour their hearts out, and I share this. And then it'll send it all over the world, and then people will write back and say, "I know you wrote this just for me." I'll get three or four emails. <laughs> I know you wrote this just for me, but it's really just. It's one ego that's getting exposed, and I just let the spirit come through. So my willingness is just to to be fully helpful and to be totally dependent on my source for that help. So there's not a sense of, of knowing ahead of time. And a lot of times people write in with the question, how do I do this? How? 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 <laughs> and I say, the Holy Spirit is the how. If you have the willingness, just the willingness, then the how is automatic. Just that little spark of willingness joined with the might of God's power and strength. You put those together and you have this explosion of joy and happiness and wisdom. And there is no effort in that explosion of, of energy. Not even the slightest bit. So, so you're not saying all that keyboarding either? You're I, just speaking into a, some sort of a... I, sit there. I don't type. I can't type. Well, how does that information but get But it's just with these little fingers... <laughs> One, two, one, right. two. You hunt and pet? Yes, it doesn't seem that way. I mean, I'm just in the <laughs> state of... Back Kathy will come in, I'll be in a state of prayer, and I'll look in and be there, and I'll be in there like this, and she'll come in and tell me something, and she just leaves me alone, I'm just if, in there. If, if, if I come in, he's either in meditation or he's typing, and he's, like, really into it. I know, not to I say anything. I thought he was using, uh, like, a <coughs> voice before. <today. laughs> he's tried some of those. <laughs> There's all kinds of different things. I can see the, the miracle of of these gatherings, you know, from another perspective, from what you're just describing it, and seeing Arvind and being in our Course in Miracles group on Sunday, and him saying, "I went to this website and it's just wonderful." You know, I just I ended up inviting these people to come, and I don't know what to do. Help me! You know? <laughs> And I'd say, you know, he's asked me all these questions. Well, what do I do? And everything. I said, oh, it's all wonderful. I said, I offer my home for two people to stay. That's where I plug in. You know, it's a, but I, I'm not into that. I don't know how to do all that stuff, you know. And I said, that's not my thing. And he said, what do you want me to do? But look. I mean, look at all these wonder, gatherings. I mean, it's like it, 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 we receive the invitations, and a lot of times, like you know, like for this trip, we're, like Arvin has really worked very closely with us on like all the gatherings, and we're staying at his house. But like the the gatherings coming to and from, like I'll just let Holy Spirit guide me on, like you know, who to call and whatever. And like, for example, the Oklahoma City, I said to Holy Spirit, well, I just, I know the host for, for Oklahoma City is going to show up today. 
And we, then we got an email that day from this woman from Oklahoma City who said, I see you're going to be in Oklahoma. I'd love to have you come to my house and host and, and share a gathering, and I'd love to host you. And so I said, oh, it's so wonderful. I sent her an email and called her. <laughs> uh, while this was transpiring, uh, I wrote a, an email to David. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I, I said... Uh, my big fear is being gullible in believing all this stuff and all that. And Dave re responded to me the same day. And I, came, I went to my Course in Miracles group and I said, I've never had anyone address me this way. I said, he's not talking to Nan. Mm. He's talking to who I really am. You know, that I don't identify with. But he speaks to me as if I am the I am. And that's who's talking, too. I, I, I really got it. Yeah, that's the joy, in the sense that I don't, I don't see evolution. I don't see that there's beginning mm -hmm. and intermediate and advanced. I just see the perfection of what is. So literally, you know, that's why when you work with the Course and you go into forgiveness, it takes you to a place where you don't see the error. You get, you're alive in the yeah, moment. Yeah, and when, when and he, he, you referred to my fear, you said something about, well, you didn't talk about my fear, the old my. You just said something about, yes, fears in the past or <coughs> something like that. I, but it's really got it. Yeah. And that's the joy of it, because that way there's, there's, there's nobody to correct, there's nobody to fix, there's nobody to change. You know, you're in a gleeful experience of the joy of it, and it just radiates. And... And then you have fun. I mean, we did stop in Oklahoma City, and this little two-year-old boy just saw me and came running up to me and just plopped in my lap and wanted me to carry him around by his ankles. And you know, and so I, I went all around through the house with him with his by his ankles and his head was like this far off the ground. He was just exploring the whole house upside down. His toys. He would be going in his toys upside down and go to see the nanny. There was a nanny there. He got to go and play with her ankles. And, you know, but just. When you get into the joy, it's just there's such a joy of just extending it, and it's like there's you're not coming at it like from a from a psychological model or a model that the world sees, where the helper then has to diagnose the problem. And of course, the miracles is saying, you know, live in the solution. If you release the problem, you're going to be living the solution, and that will be the blessing. Not trying to say, oh what's going on in your life and what's the problem and trying to, like the old model, of trying to dig down and go through it. It's just whatever is most helpful can pour through when you are in that state of joy. So that's really what my experience is. I, are you saying you never feel any resistance? I feel just joy. I mean, I, I have to have say... Have you that, ever felt any resistance? Oh, but the illusion of the journey was wet with tears was, um, I remember... Um, going through years of, of reading, listening to music, and even the music would flush up the resistance and the struggle. Going to movies and, and feeling the emotions, just like an emotional roller coaster ride, that would flush up all the resistance right up in my face, so to speak, or right into my awareness. And then instead of like, you know, people saying, oh, let's go out for a drink or this and that, I would either sit in the theater if they let me, the process, and to fully feel and move through that resistance, or I would go out into the car and I wouldn't even go home. I would just stay out in the parking lot. I said, I would think this is too valuable of an opportunity. This stuff that's buried down there is, I've watched this movie, like something like Terms of Endearment, and I've just been on an emotional roller coaster ride and all my emotions are right up there in my consciousness. This is too precious to let this opportunity go by. So, yeah, there was lots of, um, seeming su surrender, opening up, turning things over, um, listening to things. Uh, I, I used to go through like family photo album because there was a lot of emotions that were flooded with all these family photos. And I thought, this is just another opportunity for me to flush up all the resistance to the love. And I'm going to use this to the hilt. And, I, and finally, when I got to the point where I could look through all the albums with no charges whatsoever, then I pitched them all. You know, I threw them all away because they, they had served their purpose, from my perspective at least. And um, and that's how it feels. Now, 
during the early years of travel too, it was like living right on the edge. I mean, I was just having all this love coming at me and all this this joy and it was fear of intimacy. It was like a frightening experience to have so much love. And then after a while I thought, well, I don't want to hold on to this resistance, so I'll let this go too. And then just got carried deeper and deeper into it. And now it's like I, I really don't experience any difference between even like travel or I mean, this is like sitting on my couch. I could just like Ramana Maharshi would always just they finally bought him a couch when he was <laughs> young ago or he just sat on the on the stones in the dirt for decades. But but then you get to a point where you just feel in the now moment and it's all the same. It's just everything is the same now. So it wouldn't matter whether I'm sitting on this thing or sitting in a van and seemingly moving across the country, sitting in an airplane, which I'm sure Argentina involved, <laughs> 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 or just sitting on a couch and just being and not feeling a need to, you know, to there's nothing to change, there's nothing to fix or whatever. So David, how do you define enlightenment? I'd say it's it's an experience of the present moment, and it's um, I would say it's analogous to complete forgiveness, where you've let all the resistance and the grievances that were buried down there rear their heads, like come on, take the lid off, <laughs> whatever's down there, any monsters, come on. Everybody, up we go, up we go, all of you, every last scrap of you down there, you know. And, and enlightenment is the place when, when you kind of had the lid off and you felt the flow and the joy of this and you, you, you're, there's no attempt to hold anything, try to hold anything anymore. You know, it's like a flow. You kind of allow yourself to be washed of every scrap of, of error. That's what the experience feels like. It's very gleeful and joyful. There's not a sense of guilt or fear. There's a sense of um, invulnerability that comes with it too, because you don't. You're not at the mercy. There's nothing outside of you to be at the mercy of, because you're like the the entirety of it. So that's another way it feels. It feels like a sense of strength and certainty, invulnerability. Um, you still have certain attachments to the body. I mean, you wear a jacket, you'd, you'd be cold if you walked outside. You'd be hot if you put your hand on the stove, those kinds of yeah, pain and suffering kinds of things that the physical body He's got it. <laughs> well, what you find is, like I, I started to explain this in the other thing, is that, that perception is selective. So the more you just focus your, stay focused in the present moment, then... It's like everything of the five senses just gets more and more peripheral. And it does feel more like a meditative state, just like sometimes when you're meditating and you may, you just kind of drop down and you seem to go a little deeper and deeper. You may not be aware of the, you know, the, the feel of your rear end on the seat. But that's the experience I have in the sense that I get into the just I'm sharing the joy and everything and it's like there's a, there's a sense of joy and connectivity and oneness, and so the five senses um, it do become more and more peripheral. So I do have a lot of those experiences. Um, one time I went to a Unity Church, and they they were going to leave the the heat on, but when they they finished the morning service, they automatically flipped off the the heat. So and we had a whole evening afternoon of sessions and this was in winter and so I remember getting in there and here we are we got a big group and we're just getting in you know how they talk about the yogis seem to generate heat when when they're in the I was just into the joy of the moment and I did notice that it, on the peripheral of my consciousness as the talk went on for hours and hours and people were in the pews and like, grabbing their coats and everything but I was really flowing in the joy of the moment so you know somebody that say, we had one of those little cube heaters, and we can aim it over there onto David, and the woman who was with me at the time, she said, don't worry, he doesn't need the cube. <laughs> he's not, you know, he's just getting so into the joy of the moment and the sharing that he's not aware. And that's the way it works. I think it works that way with 
with hunger, with temperature things, and so on and so forth, it just becomes more peripheral. So like it's like you're encased or you're within this warm glow in the center of your mind and your being, and you feel these other things like in the peripheral of your consciousness. But that's the way it has been my experience, it does get peripheral. <laughs>